All right, just started this recording. Hey, everybody. Today we're doing decision trees, topic 20, 29. Uh, but before I start, two questions. Uh, one, um, we talked about pd.getdummies last phase. And then this phase, we introduced scikit-learn's version, which is one hot encoder. Essentially, they do the same thing. Now, by default, um, one hot encoder does not drop first, which I think. Well, I don't think that's the default for get dummies either, but we learned last phase that you should drop first for um, for pd.get dummies when you're doing a regression. Now, the reason you drop first for a regression is actually to, pre uh, to prevent multicollinearity, because if you have every single column, let's say you have five categorical variables, you can sort of infer the result of one from the other four, and that is a source of multicollinearity. Now, for one hot encoding, um, you can, first of all, you can tell it to drop first if you like, or you can tell it to drop a specific, I think you can tell it to drop a specific one if you want. Now, what we're going to talk about is that uh, for a lot of models that we're going to talk about this week, some of the models we talked about last week, multicollinearity is not an issue. Um, so therefore, you don't have to drop first. I would say the, I think, yeah, the only one that you would have to drop first would be for uh, logistic regression because logistic regression also has a multicollinearity assumption. So one hot encoder, um, because most non-parametric models um, don't have multicollinearity as an assumption, it actually doesn't matter if you don't drop the first. Um, and you'll actually see from what we're going to talk about later today, um, it actually might be more helpful if you don't drop first because you can actually get information from that feature. Um, so that's on one hot encoder. Any Follow up on that. Um, yeah. So, what do you do if you're using a logistical regression model in addition to other ones? Um, so, when you're doing logistic regression, I actually will tell you all that for logistic regression for this project, because the goal of this project is to not. Okay, there's one exception, but the goal of this project is really not to like um, do a lot of data, what's the word? It's less changes on your data, more changes in terms of modeling that we're going to focus on this time. In the sense of like, you know, with last project with linear regression, we're always using a linear regression is just different uh, forms of our data, right? We were maybe like scaling some things, we were um, dropping some features. So all of the changes that we did were on our data. The whole purpose of this project is not that. The whole purpose of this project is to really do more model exploration. So if you were to use logistic regression for this project, which you can, um, I would say at the very least, just run a vanilla logistic regression. If the assumptions are not fulfilled, you'll see that your results are probably not good. Only if that's the one that you decide that you want to tune and get really into the weeds of, then yes, I would say if you are picking logistic regression, which to be honest, most people don't because of all of these assumptions, um, unless you're picking logistic regression, you actually don't have to worry about those assumptions. Um, if you do find that, okay, logistic regression, if I'm running a vanilla logistic regression model and it still outperforms all of the others, then yeah, then it's worth putting in the effort to make sure that your data aligns with all of these assumptions that are needed um, for logistic regression, including you know dropping first in your one hot encoder. But I would say like as a first pass for all of your models, I wouldn't, get into like, okay, I have to specifically do this for this model, um, or at least not to a, the depth of, you know, tweaking something like your one hot encoder. Um, but yeah, in the real world though, when you have a, like a large scale project where you do want to try out logistic regression, like seriously, because this is essentially still like a one week long project, not, it's just our main constraint is time. In the real world, though, you you should be doing your due diligence with the assumptions prior to even modeling. So it's really more because this is such a short time frame for this project that we don't have time to get to the weeds for of that, you know, the one model that has assumptions. Because for the rest of the, the models that we're talking about in this phase, none of them have assumptions like logistic regression. But technically, if you're writing a function to do this and say you had a list of all the classifiers, Fires you were using and you were iterating through it, you could write some if statements to deal with some of those processes that would be applicable to some and not applicable to others. Yeah, that's right. So one yeah. of the one of the things would be like scalers, right? Like uh, I think last last week we talked about 
how logistic regression needs scaling, k nearest neighbors need scaling, actually all of today's models, as well as like Bayes classification do not need scaling. So yeah, you could technically code something in there, maybe like a true false for scalar, uh, whether you want to scale your data for the specific model or not. So yes, it's really up to you how in-depth you want to go with it. I do recommend like just for, you know, um, the ease of just the project process in general, um, I would really only get into the weeds of like the one, two models uh, rather than like trying to, to get all like eight, nine, 10 of your models working like perfectly. But yeah, it really depends on like the, like when you decide to start your project in relation to, you know, when it's due, how much time you're giving yourself, so on and so forth. All things I'm happy to talk about uh, at one on ones. Cool. Um, anything else with regards to, I guess, pre processing? All right. Well, the other question that came up was when you are scripting, and scripting is something that we talked about uh, at the end of last phase in some of our office hours. When you write a function and put it into your .py file, uh, what are best practices for what to import? So as an example, one thing that will definitely work, and I did mention this before the recording started, one thing that will definitely work is if you do all the same import statements that are in your notebook, then your function will work absolutely fine. However, there'll be a lot of redundancy because if you're importing uh, everything two times, that's just not necessary. Um, but it also does depend on how you're importing your function. So as an example, I'm just going to make a very, very quick function. And I'm not, I'm going to also do that. Uh, I'm going to do an overly simple one. So let's just do like a double function that doubles your numbers. Return x times 2. Okay. Oops, I did not mean to do this. I meant to do this in a pi file. X file. All right, let's do function.py. And we have this function over here. Okay. So let's talk about import statements because there are a bunch of different ones. So a few ways you can import. You can do import fn. And import fn will sort of run the entire script. If it runs the entire script, you would have to do fn.double and then give it the number, and that's how it works. However, you can do from fn import star. This is another import method that you would have to use the same thing, I believe, yeah. Actually, this is kind of redundant, but basically if you do any of these methods, it will execute the entire script because you're importing the whole file and here import star just needs import all, so you're actually gonna run the whole script. Now, if you were to do from fn import double, that's slightly different because it's only going to look for the specific function not execute the whole thing, but only, only import the specific function. So if I'm importing it this way, I don't have to do fn dot. I can actually straight away do double uh, form. Um, so if you're doing it this method, then you still will have to import, actually, I believe you actually might not have to, hmm. oh, I have to think about this. I haven't done this in a while, to be honest, but I believe that if you're doing it this way, because it still executes the function, it executes this function as you import it, you still might have to import only the things that are in the function. You know what? I'll get back to you on that. I kind of like forgot. Because I know there's one way to import it where you might not have to import all the libraries. I'll get back to you all on that. But that was a good question. I have to think back to like Python theory. <laughs> Um, I don't know if this is uh, just sort of riffing, but like since you're putting it all into your central notebook, and I assume they're all going to be like all the import statements will be together when mm -hmm. you're importing this py file, um, because you're importing everything else that you may or may not need right above it, mm -hmm. and then you're just importing this, wouldn't yeah. it make sense that you don't need any import statements in the py file since they're all being imported right above that import? Mm -hmm. So I know that for, if you had, if you imported it these ways, you have to import it in your, uh, you have to import it in the PY file because it executes the entire thing. So if you were using like train test split in here, 
if you're using your team chain test oh, within okay, your function exactly, here, yeah. it'll say like chain test split is not defined. So if you're importing everything at the same time, or if you're importing like either this method or this method, you will have this one, you definitely have to import uh, any of the things that you're using within your function. That's definitely, I know for sure. But I have to double check, like if you don't import it, if you do an import of the specific function, whether you have to do that or not, I'll, I'll double check and then you'll know. Yeah, because my question, I was just sort of like, I did a little bit of Googling about this because my thought process was that if you're defining your functions in a separate Python file and in the function, you defined the import of that package. So like if in def double you input from sklearn.whatever oh, import okay. train test split and you did it inside your function, then it would be contained basically in the local space of the function. So when you brought it into your other Python file, then it would be contained. But I know best practices is to import all the packages at the top. So I was just, and if you do it in both places, you introduce redundancy and unnecessary computation. I just. That's right. Yeah. I will say you definitely, it's definitely not good practice to have import statements within a function. That's okay. for sure. Okay. But yeah, I'll do some like playing around and like update you all on Slack about that. So when you call a dot py file, it's kind of like running a dot, it's kind of similar to running dot bats and dot exes when you're looking kind at actual. Of actual programming where you where if you're if you're running if you're doing actual like writing a program mm -hmm. when you call you, when you run a bat a batch file it runs every statement in that batch file and if it screws up once it stops that's right yeah so it's, it's, it's the similar mm -hmm. thing so like say for say for instance with our function that we're doing you in theory could put all of your import statements and your function in the same py file and it would yeah. import the entire thing Correct, because yeah, it's absolutely. kind of the same thing as running a batch file. Yeah, that's right. Okay. If you wanted to like define a function that imports all the things for you, you could also do that. Uh, but yeah, you're right. When you, especially if you're doing, and I have to double check for this, what actually gets imported. But for this and this, it kind of works in the same way that you know when you when you define a bunch of functions in a Jupyter notebook cell, it all has to execute first. And doing either of these import statements executes your entire Python script in the container of your notebook, if that makes sense, uh, to define yeah, so within your notebook. Yeah, because if you look at it from an object-oriented programming standpoint, any program, any batch file or any program exe that you run executes statement one till statement n. So you mm -hmm. tell it to stop everything, like just in yeah. sequential order. So, so Python files work exactly, a dot .py would be exactly the same. Like if you wanted to import a bunch of functions and just save them in one Python file, granted that yeah. would probably be silly because mm -hmm. you lose the ability to take things out and not take things out, but it would be similar, right? It would be like, because the batch file, it just runs until, that's why you have to run it through Emacs and compilers, but it, it would run it from the start to finish, just code one told, it's told to stop. Yeah, that's right. So, and that's the reason why if you wanted to like define a bunch of variables, you can actually define variables here as well. You know, if you all remember like when you were dealing with like APIs and API keys, in the same way, that's what we were doing, right? We were basically creating, a, we were saving them as variables in a Python file for your Jupyter Notebook to execute outside of itself. So that you know you can still have your passwords. Uh, so yeah, it's it's being executed. But I will double check on you for I'll double check on this and what imports are needed for those. Sweet, good discussion, team. Um, any other questions before we start getting to this next model? All right, cool. Uh, so this next model that we're going to talk about is decision trees. And decision trees are extremely, extremely powerful. Um, you'll see that there are a lot of pros, some cons to decision, to decision trees, and we'll actually keep talking about how trees are used in other contexts tomorrow and the day after. Um, so to start, we're going to talk about what decision trees are 
And decision trees actually exist for both regression and classification. So I did want to talk about regression first, because I do think the cost function is a little easier to understand uh, with regression first, but we'll talk about classification and just know that for this project, you only have to worry about classification. Um, and then we'll talk about cost functions, implementation, and pruning of trees. There are a lot of uh, tree puns that are used in the data science community because of these models. Um, and then we'll talk about the pros and cons. So to think about decision trees, think of flow charts. Um, the way that decision trees work really act, they, and you'll see later, they're really pretty much flow charts. So um, let's say you wanted to classify replies to party invitations and based on a bunch of features. And in this, uh, in this example that I pulled from Google, I just Googled flow chart. Um, the features, I guess, would be any girls and will Miley join or not. And so based on the answers or based on the values of those features, you can make a, make a classification on whether you will go or not go. So later when we break down a decision tree, you'll actually see there are a bunch of these kind of like conditional statements that define which direction of classification that data point will go. So in this case, you'll see, all right, girls, yes or no. If it's no, we'll go. If it's yes, we'll hit another. Um, We'll hit another node and we'll talk about terminology in the next slide as well. Next question, yes, no, go, won't go. So um, in numerical data, it will usually be, okay, is this value above or below a certain amount? If yes, if like it's above or if it's below, it'll go down the tree with a bunch of different conditionals based on different parts of your data. And we'll get into how those are created in a little bit. In terms of terminology, uh, the first question that is asked or the first condition is a root node, the last one is a terminal node, and anything in between is a child node. So these are all nodes, um, and actually when you see the outputs of decision trees, they look just like this. They actually do look like flowcharts, which we will see in a little bit as well. All right, so each of these are branches, again, going along with the tree metaphor. This is what it is. So what are we doing here? We're basically asking a bunch of questions about each data point to find out where they will be classified. And in the context of numerical data, it a lot of times will be, all right, is a value above or below a certain amount? If yes, then it'll go this way. If not, it'll go a different way. And so you can imagine for a very, very large decision trees, for a very large decision tree, you have a bunch of branches that keep branching out, so on and so forth. And for, uh, for traditional decision trees, each node splits into only two branches. So it's usually one threshold, two branches. Um, quick segue, in your, uh, in your labs, in your Canvas labs, there is one lesson that talks about ID3 trees. Uh, those are a different kind of tree that can actually split into multiple, uh, multiple branches per node. But just remember that that's not a traditional decision tree but also another algorithm that you can use. But just in case anyone was curious why that one splits into like, I think in your example, it might split it to three versus two. It's a non-traditional decision tree. Okay. So because we are splitting based on, you know, a condition of whether, uh, and in this case, if this is a, think of this as like a dummy variable, any girls, yes or no, zero or one. You can sort of think of it as like, okay, we're creating a threshold between zero and one. Uh, we're sort of partitioning our feature space somewhere between zero and one to help us classify whether it's go or won't go. Um, so that's kind of like the underlying concept behind decision trees. Before we get into like a concrete example that we're going to work through, any questions? Nice. Okay, so this is the data that we're going to use. This is a two feature data set describing professional baseball players the number of years of experience that they have, and the number of hits that they've made, hit, the number of hits. Um, and then what we're trying to predict here, and we're gonna start with a regression example, that what they're trying to predict here is their salary. And so just for to simplify it, we're gonna use like the colors of the rainbow. Purple is low salary um, to blue, green, yellow, orange, red. Red is high. And so we're trying to predict salary. Um, the color of the dots just represents the salary, and then here we just have two features. So let's just say we want to build a model that predicts how much a player makes based on hits and years. 
So what we're going to do here and how a decision tree works, if we're going to segment or partition the feature space and after like dividing our feature space a bunch, the average value of each space will be the predicted value. So intuitively, and I'll expand more in a bit, intuitively, we want to maximize the homogeneity or similarity within each region. So just as a quick example, and I'll actually show you all the real example in a little bit. When I say partitioning the feature space, let's just say, looking at this diagram, how should I first partition this feature space? And I don't have exact numbers yet, but okay, it looks like a, a bunch of like blues and purples are over here. And like the red, orange, yellows are like around this closer to the top right section. So as a first partition, let's say, okay, it seems like this over here, this orange line that I just drew might be a good partition. And how this partition is decided, we'll talk about later. That's actually where the cost function comes in. But as we keep partitioning the space, you can think of that as like the nodes in our um, the nodes in our flowchart. So here, maybe I can say, all right, if they have played for less than six years or more than six years, that will be our first uh, branching out from our first node, from our root node. And then this can actually keep going on. So um, let's say at this point, let's think where's the next best partition to, to put. And I could say, all right, so let's see, maybe like on this right side, it looks like you have a bunch of like greens and blues down here and more reds and yellows over here. Let's say I split it over here. So the second question I might ask in my flow chart is, okay, well, out of the people who have more than six years of experience, um, do they have more or less than 100 hits? And that's how this is treat built. Um, we're gonna talk about how they figure out the best partition in a little bit. Uh, but this is how it goes. It just subdivides and subdivides your feature space. And of course, this is only two features. Uh, they can do this across however many features you have in your data set. Um, so what I mentioned before, intuitively, we want to maximize homogeneity or similarity within each region. So ideally, you keep continuing this process of like dividing and dividing and dividing such that every point in a region and so let's just say we keep doing this and this is not reflective of the data but let's say we keep dividing these over and over again until we get to as much homogeneity or similarity within each region so just as a quick example imagine that we like segmented out i don't know this area and in this area, everything is purple so that you know that anything that falls within that region of between, let's see, under two years of experience and between, I don't know, 30 to 125 years uh, hits, sorry, uh, they would have whatever the purple value of salary is. Any questions about the intuition here? Can, can you make it? Um, can your like if else if then statement be like if less than six years of experience and less than 150 hits? Can you can mm. you have like a multi multiple? Yeah, or is that like the other the other uh, model that you're ID three uh, or whatever? Yeah, so ID three actually both of them. Uh, every time you make. Every time you're trying to decide on a split, you do that on a feature by feature basis. So usually you'll end up hitting most features. So let's say you, okay, let me just undo all of these lines. So here we did two things. We looked at like um, experience above or below six years, and we looked at hits above or below 100. Notice that this line didn't go all the way across because each time you're only dividing one, because by like the nature of a flowchart, you're already subdividing. So uh, to answer your question one, no, you only look at one feature at a time. And there's a reason for that. We'll get into that, the cost function in a little bit. Um, and then also, yeah, whenever you make a subdivision, it has to be off of an already divided section. So instead of doing this, it has to be something like this because of the nature of the flowchart. But yeah, that's a good question. You are only looking at one feature at a time when you're defining your uh, your conditionals. And by the way, you don't have to come up with these conditionals at all. Um, 
the model does it all for you. Again, you only have to do the dot fit dot predict step, but I'm going to talk about how the model decides what the best uh, partition will be. Thanks. Any other questions at this point? All right. Okay, to the next slide. So yeah, we talked about this in a little bit. We're going to divide the space into distinct and non-overlapping. That was a phrase I probably should have used, non-overlapping. And the values of the prediction are the mean values of each region. So let's just say I have um, a data point that is three years. And I guess in this case, it doesn't matter how many hits they have. The predicted salary will be 225. 225,000. If it falls in this region, it looks like it'll be 464,000. If it falls in this region, it looks like it'll be 949,000. And of course, the more partitioning that you do, the more granularity you get in your prediction. Because in this case, in this regression tree example, uh, you're only going to have three possible values of uh, three possible values of salary predictions, which, as you all know now, it is kind of underfit. Uh, so the more partitioning you have, the more possible values of salaries you can get, which of course can also lead to overfitting, but we'll talk about that uh, either later today or tomorrow. I forgot which when we're going to talk about that. So, <clears throat> so let's say, okay, so this result actually does come from a regression tree that was built. These numbers are actually the ones that came out from the model, and I'll show you all how to do how to get these later as well. But based on this model, if I had a test data point of someone who has six years of experience and let's just say 112 hits, um, what would the prediction of salary be? You literally just follow it. So six years, it will be either this, this or this, R2 or R3, and 112 hits, 112 hits would put it into this region. So the predicted salary for that person will be 464,917. Any questions about this? We're about to get into the cost function. All right, and how these numbers are defined, like how do we get these numbers is, is just the average salary value of every training data point that is in the region. That's what these, that's how these numbers are, uh, how you get these numbers. Cool, exciting part, cost function. This is kind of intimidating, but I'm gonna break it down. So the cost function that is used to train regression trees is actually mean squared error. Uh, the cost function is actually different for regression trees and classification trees. I'll talk about classification trees later, but it is mean squared error. As you can see here, this should look kind of similar, familiar, I mean. You have your actual y and your y hat, and your y hat is your predictive value. So your best split is decided where your overall MSC is the lowest, and MSC is defined by, you know, okay, so let's say, let's take this as an example. Then the mean R1 was, was it 225? Yeah, so the mean R1 was 225, 225,000. MSC, the way that you calculate that, is you just take each of these salary values and find the mean squared difference between the actual values and 225. And so how you decide where the best split is, and let's just say we don't have the second split, but you're going to take a vertical line at years and keep moving it back and forth to find where I get the lowest MSE overall. So based on this model, it seems that 4.5 gives you the lowest MSE um, if I'm trying to figure out years. And at any one time, it's trying to figure out the best split. It's going to look over every single feature. So to define or how the model decided on this 4.5 years as the first partition is you can assume that it has looked through every possible value between, not every, it does gradient descent, so it actually can sort of like narrow down where it is, but it's looking at a bunch of possibilities, not just in years, but it's also going to look across a number of hits as well. It's going to do its due diligence, look across all different features before deciding on the best split. So that's what this, wait, where is it? Yeah, that's where this uh, equation is. And let me just box this up. So this equation over here is saying that, okay, if I have a split, and let's just say I have the split of like 4.5, we're looking to minimize RMSE between 
all of, let me use a different color, all of these points over here and 225K and all of these points here and the average of whatever these averages. So apparently at years equal 4.5 being a partition, that's where you have the lowest MSC across all of them. And MSC, you're comparing each salary data point to the average salary in the region. And the average salary in the region does change as you move the line around. So it is looking out for that as well. All right, so that is the cost function. It is done through gradient descent. So you usually set some sort of initial value of your partition. Um, and then it searches through that. And usually there is an initial value per feature um, and it's going to search through all of that using gradient descent to figure out what the best bit at any time is. Now this approach is top down and greedy, which pros and cons to that. So the fact that it's top down is that it begins at the top of the tree and from one single variable splits the feature space. Um, so it decided, okay, the first partition that we're going to use, let me get rid of all these boxes. The first partition we're going to use is 4.5 years. And the second partition we're going to do is out of the people who have more than 4.5 years of experience, let's divide it at like 117.5 hits. So top down means that, okay, we're only deciding on this second split based on the first split. So you could say that maybe for this data, it might be better if we first split it, like we first split at 117 and then split another region at 4.5. However, the model does not know that because it is top down. It only does it one step at a time. It doesn't really do any of that forward looking to say, if I were to reverse the order of these splits, how would it look, right? It's the difference between a partition space that looks like this versus maybe something like this and then this. Maybe this is better, the model will actually never know. Because at the very first split, the 4.5 years is better than the 117.5. Um, but yeah, that's also kind of similar to how it's greedy, top down and greedy, because the best split is made at each step in, instead of picking the best like global or overall split or series of splits. So a couple pros and cons about uh, how regression trees, actually all trees work to start. Questions about this? All right, so gonna talk about um, implementing this in a Jupyter notebook now. And this notebook, I realized that it wasn't in your repo before today. So I put that on this morning in case you're looking for it. All right, so a bunch of things that we're importing and we're gonna use actually the same hitters uh, data that is represented here, same data. Cool. So what we're going to do, take a look at our data. I dropped some null values. Uh, we have hits, years, and salary. So similar as we, similar thing as we've done with our other models. Let's split our X and Y. We do our train test split. And we instantiate our tree. So let's start with a decision tree with max depth of five. I'll talk about the hyperparameters in a little bit as well. So instantiate a tree, fit the tree, and I'll show you all some cool things. So before I get to this step, we can actually get predictions and we can see our mean squared error and root mean squared error. So right now, our root mean squared error is at 353. What the number is, I actually don't know. We didn't do EDA, but that's how you implement the model. This is a really neat visualization if your data set is not too big. So what this code does, it actually produces our decision tree. It shows you this decision tree. So let me, hopefully I can zoom in. It's not too blurry. Nice. Okay. So here, and I'll like read it out just in case y'all can't see. Can I zoom in more? Doesn't really let me zoom in effectively, but okay. At this step over here, this first node, it chose a split of X1 less than or equal to 4.5, which is the salary that we had. Uh, sorry, the, the years, the number of years of experience, sorry. And from here, they chose this as our first threshold, true, false, and then they keep on splitting. Uh, they keep on splitting based on you know whatever it decides is the best threshold. So from here, the one that we saw in the slideshow was out of the people who have a years of experience more than four point five, we then split it into x zero greater than or less than one hundred seventeen point five which it's split to here and here. 
Now, what I did was I set max steps equal to five. We're going to get into more details about this in a little bit, but max steps equal to five basically tells it that my tree can go five layers deep. So you can see here, one, two, three, four, five. So that process is going to keep continuing. And at the end, you can see that each of these terminal nodes has an associated value. So whenever you have a test data point, you just have to bring it through this tree and you can figure out its value. So here you can see that this one over here, 79.136. Uh, this one is 113.381, so on and so forth. What's also neat, you can see how many training samples actually ended up in each partition section. So here, and I know it's very small, but um, here there are 11 samples, 21 in this root node, sorry, in this terminal node, 9, 9, 1, so on and so forth. Um, as long as you don't have too many features and your max depth isn't too large, you can actually inspect some of this, which is really neat. Um, I'll tell you when this becomes less efficient is let's just say I set my max depth to be 10. Because the number of nodes increases, is it exponentially? Yeah, exponentially. You'll see that this image is not going to be very useful. So many nodes here. I mean, sometimes it might be helpful to see like, okay, what are the things that are helping it split at the very start? So maybe you can look at that. But once you get down to here, um, it becomes much less useful because the readability interpretability goes down. But a useful graphic nonetheless, especially if you have a smaller, a smaller tree. All right, questions about this. So are there any other oh. ways to display that? Like if if you uh, want to like cut it off at a certain point or something like that? Yeah, like if you fanned those out a little bit more, you might be able to like look at a small sector. Are there any tools that help you look at decision big decision trees in, in better ways? Yes, yes. You can actually export this image. Um one one quick way is you can export this image as like a high res PNG and you can like zoom in and like look at that. I think there is. I, I don't remember if it is this library, but if you look at it, I've seen Medium articles about it. Uh, uh, you can actually have it uh, truncate at a certain depth, so you only see like the top. Or you can also, um, from a decision tree, you can actually get all of its steps. So I think, let me pull up the decision trees. Decision trees. One of the outputs allows you to find like, you know, all of the conditional statements. And I think it is out of here. I think it's the pruning path or decision path, sorry, decision path. So you can figure out like how your data points are getting funneled through the tree. I personally haven't used that because I don't know, once you get a lot of features, it doesn't matter. And there is actually something that I'll show you all at the end of this that is a very useful uh, attribute of decision trees where you can actually get information about your features. But yeah, any other questions? Neat. Okay, so whenever you're hyperparameter tuning a uh, decision tree or any tree based model, they call it tree pruning um, because the tree metaphor, I guess. Um, and there are actually a lot of hyperparameters for decision trees compared to some of the other models that we've already spoken about. So for example, naive Bayes only had like that alpha parameter. Um, for logistic regression, you have, um, I guess there's an intercept one, but there's also like a regularization parameter. Decision trees have a lot of very useful parameters. Some main ones that I wanna talk about are, oh, actually, I'll talk about some of the main ones first. I do list the main important ones in the model summary sheet. Uh, but first, uh, criterion, actually this is for decision tree, so I'll talk about criterion later. But max depth, how deep do you want the tree to go? If you do max depth equal to none, uh, it'll actually keep expanding the tree until every node has the same value. Every terminal node's data points have the exact same value. So your tree, if you have like a thousand unique uh, salary values, you're going to end up with a thousand terminal nodes. Um, there's also min sample split, the minimum number of samples required to split an internal node. So let's say when you're doing your splitting, at some point, one node just has one data point left, 
or, or let's say it has five data points left and you set mid sample split to five, that one won't get split even more. It's one way to help to uh, control for overfitting. Actually, max that's is also something you can do to control overfitting. Min samples, leaf, a minimum number of samples required to be a leaf node. That's something you can tune as well. Um, another good one is max features. And max features, I'll actually come back to tomorrow, but the number of features to consider when looking for the best split. So to help combat overfitting, and this is something that we'll talk more about tomorrow, you can have it at any node, not look at some features. But that's more important for tomorrow's material. Um, but yeah, the ones I talked about earlier, basically what defines what can be split or not, those are the main things that you will too. Which you can do via grid search, which is something that I talked about on Friday. Cool. So one way to do pruning uh, is, to is to grow the tree very deep and prune it back to a subtree by using cross-validation to find the lowest possible MSE, visualized with a validation curve. Now, uh, max depth is actually a very, very important parameter. I would say top two parameters for a decision tree because it is actually very, very, it is the main um, it is the main hyperparameter that does cause overfitting. Because if you imagine, if you let it go max step equal to none, every terminal node is going to be just one value, you're going to end up with strong overfitting. So this is one way to tune max depth. Of course, you can use grid search as well. But you can see here, um, range of depth from one to nine, what is our RMSC for our test set? So here you can see the RMSC, which is the same metric that we used for linear regression. We have the lowest error at depth of two. And after this, it starts to overfit. Um, I wish it saved our, oh, I guess this is doing cross-validation, so it doesn't have train versus test. But yeah, goes to show that, you know, when you get too deep, uh, if your tree gets to go too deep, it usually leads to overfitting. And you see that our um, error for prediction does start to go up after a while, which is something that we'll talk about more over the next couple of study groups. All right. Um, that's just something really quick about implementation of a couple of the parameters. I want to talk about classification trees now. Any questions before we get to that? Okay, so oops, back. Just to remember what the difference is between classification and regression is really about your target variable. Classification, categorical, regression, continuous. And for classification trees, um, how best splits are determined, slightly different from what we just did with regression trees. Regression trees, it looked at where you get the lowest MSC per side of the split. Uh, Going to be slightly different for classification, we'll talk about it as well. Um, and just a question for you to think about, what are some hyperparameters? This is something you'll get used to. Okay, let's just go back to our IRS data set from before. And for this, we're just going to use pedal width and pedal length. And as you remember, if you remember, I think we did use this data set for, yeah, logistic regression. Um, we had three species, um, which are represented by the three shades of purple. So based on this, and based on how we did it last time, you know, same idea, right? We want to split our segment, our data set. So maybe it goes like something like this, because now we have purity here, and then maybe something like this. So we have like a couple of misclassifications in the training set. That's just how it is. And the idea here, again, we want to predict species. However, we cannot use MSE because what is the value for all of these? The value for these, these are species of flowers. There's no value uh, there. And you cannot really take the average of species because those are, those are names. So instead of MSE, we have to use a different metric to define where the best fit is. And that would be genie or entropy, which is what we saw over here. Uh, this is the documentation for decision trees. You can see criterion, Gini, or entropy. Um, if we actually quickly look at uh, decision tree regressor, pull it up real quick. This one. Hold on, I want to get the. Where did it go? Decision tree regressor. Learn. There we go. Okay, so here you can use MSE, 
this, these are just other ones, but you can also use MAE, which is like mean absolute error. So you can also choose what criterion you want to use. So similarly, for classification, you can use either Gini or entropy. And both are sort of measures of purity within a node. So just to talk about some of these criterions, uh, first, there's Gini purity index, uh, which is measured between 0 to 0 0.5, where I think 1 is more pure. Yeah, 1 is more pure. And oh, sorry, 0 is more pure. And then 1 is more, uh, 1 is more impure, I guess, which is basically you take the ratio of uh, the number of points per side. So first, what you're going to do, let's just say that we have iPhones and Androids. And in a single partition, we have 25 data points, 10 of which are iPhones, 15 of which are, um, 15 of which are Androids. If you take the Gini, um, the Gini formula and apply it, you get 0 0.48. So actually, this is impure. So 0 0.5 is impure, 0 is pure. I misspoke earlier because entropy is different. Um, OK. So that is one of the criteria that you can use. Very, very similar to MSE, but you're basically saying, all right, what is the composition of each segment? So that's one of the cost function metrics that you can use. You just want to, I guess, reduce um, Gini purity or get a low number for Gini purity. Another metric that you can use, and usually the results, depending on um, for either metric, are pretty similar until you get to the very end. Uh, but you can also look at entropy, and entropy has its own formula here. Uh, I think one is one is less pure, and zero is more pure. I always forget the direction, but doesn't matter because the uh, algorithm will do it for you. Question? I thought I maybe heard something. Cool. All right. So. In the kind of similar way as MSE does, it is again looking for homogeneity between within each of the sections. So for this data set, this is how the model actually turned out. So I actually was quite surprised when I saw this because I expected it to be like here for some reason. But for this case, it actually said that the best actual splits were first looking at, I think it's this one over here, and then the second one over here, whether it's above or below 2.45 and whether it's above or below 4.75 to do its classification. Cool. And I think in this case, yeah, X2 is pedal length. Awesome. So before we go into implementation of classification trees, which is actually very, very similar, let's talk about some quick pros and cons. So advantages, trees can be used for both classification and regression, can be displayed graphically, and it's actually very easy to interpret non-parametric, so you don't have to worry about any assumptions. So you actually don't have to worry about multicollinearity. You also don't have to scale anything. Yeah, that's actually the next point. You don't have to worry about the distribution of your data being a certain way, unlike linear regression or logistic regression. Don't be scaling. And trees actually automatically will account for interaction as well, because for a single data point, you're looking at a combination of features being above or below a certain you know, different threshold. So it actually automatically accounts for interaction in just the way uh, partitions are being made. Disadvantages, it doesn't perform very well compared to state-of-the-art machine learning models. Now, this statement is specifically for decision trees. Uh, tomorrow and the day after, we're gonna talk about uh, models that make use of decision trees as like building blocks to bigger models. So those work a lot better. Um, Recursive binary splitting, which is the, you know, the gradient descent process of deciding where the best splits are, they make locally optimal decisions that may not result in a globally optimal tree. The whole thing about it being top down and greedy, that does end up being a disadvantage sometimes. And also easy overfitting. Uh, the fact that um, the predictions that you make are really based on what data points are left per each section does lead to overfitting sometimes. And maybe in your projects, you might encounter that as well. Um, and in the next couple of days, we'll talk about methods to combat that. Cool. Questions about any of these? Assumptions, not assumptions, pros and cons. Sweet. OK, so I'm really excited oh. to learn. Oh, I'm really Go excited ahead. to learn more about the. Are we going to learn about the use of the decision trees like in combination with other models? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we are. are. OK, that's tomorrow. Okay.
Okay, cool. It's just like the one that you ran earlier, that would be maybe an example of when you would employ that where you checked um, like the best split was on the second level, but mm -hmm. that doesn't yield a whole lot of useful predictive power. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're going to talk about ways in which, um, actually we'll get to that tomorrow because yeah, it's super exciting. Like tomorrow's models are like my actual favorite models. Um, so we'll talk about that then. Uh, but they are built off of a bunch of decision trees, just as a quick preview to that. Um, any other questions before I quickly run through this implementation? Okay, so we have our IRIS data set. We loaded it exactly the same way as we did before. And if we visualize, this is where I got the, the visualization that's on the slides. And then we have our train and test split over here. And what we're doing here is we are instantiating and fitting our model. So cool, we have our stuff instantiated. We can take a look at our tree. If I increase the max depth, actually, I wonder if I increase the max depth to five, how will this come? Yeah, it pretty much gets to almost perfect purity. I guess not, yeah, huh, not perfect purity in five splits, but this one stops because it is pure already. And the rest will just keep going down you can see that this stops here. Oh, and these values here, this basically says that, okay, we have 36 data points of class one, zero data points of class zero and two respectively. So zero, 36, zero. So anytime you only have one number, that's where it stops because max depth uh, until pure. So here, I think if I were to continue max depth of six, this one will continue to split even more. So actually, let's try that. Max depth of six, which I think is not 65. Yeah, there we go. We'll split until every node is pure. Um, so yeah, if you have a small data set, this is usually pretty useful. Um, next, we can take a look at our classification and we have our accuracy score, perfect accuracy, that's great. Um, but in your projects, you will use your function and you will get the confusion matrix and the classification report. Works exactly the same way. Uh, you will get those metrics exactly the same way you would for those other models too. Um, but yeah. Same thing, you can take a look at different depths and cross-validated values. Here you can see that after like two or maybe three, it kind of plateaus off. Um, and the reason you don't want to maybe do like, okay, I want to have a max depth of nine for good measure. A couple of reasons for that. One, possible overfitting. Two, also um, computational power. You'll see that with a lot of decision trees, uh, especially with big data sets, it can take a little while to run. Imagine that at every single node, you're looking through every feature and trying to figure out the best split. If you have like 20 features, it's going to search through 20 different dimensions of like where the best split is. So the more depth you give it, the longer it might take to run. And um, especially if you're looking at big data sets, something like that is pretty important. Um, computational time is pretty important. But yeah. These are decision trees. Um, I would say probably some of the most commonly used classification models are decision trees um, and things that are built off of decision trees more, more, more so to be more accurate. Um, but yeah, any questions about anything that I shared today? Awesome. Uh, again, send me your functions as you're working on them. Um, if you want to test that it works on any model, you can instantiate a decision tree to see if it works. On, on your data, on whatever you're testing it on. Um, but yeah, if there's nothing else, don't forget your blogs. Don't forget this function that you have to do. And I will talk to you all tomorrow. We're going to talk about ensemble methods, which is basically how you combine a bunch of trees together. All right. I will talk to you all tomorrow. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.